Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, episode 76. This week, Anthony gears up his calendar, and Chris goes old Ron Burgundy with his castles. Our feature review has us going back to our mailbag and bringing out your listener feedback and answering those questions with Drew. You're listening to a proud member of the Dice Tower Network, dedicated to bringing podcasters together for the greater good of gaming. It's sort of like Voltron, but with better lip syncing. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast about board gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. This is Anthony. And this is Drew. We are back with our part two of our listener feedback episode. Yay! And we got Drew back once Whoa. again. <laughs> so not only do we have your comments, your questions, your ideas, but we got Drew to answer them this week so the rest of yeah. us could take a nap. <laughs> I, I, I know. I'm, I'm away a lot, but when the listeners talk back to us, I'm there for you. Believe there you me. go. I'm there. The listeners were waiting for you to come back to add some <laughs> extra questions to the mix. We've collected all your questions, comments, responses. They are coming in all the time. We're really grateful to get them. As we say each and every week, this podcast is about you and the insane fun that we all have at the table together. And we really want to make this podcast what you want to listen to. So keep the questions and comments and everything coming, and we'll continue to get those out on the air. And if they're even somewhat slightly related to Drew, we'll drag Drew out of that rondelle and back onto the episode. <laughs> and not to mention, as we always say, if you have anything to say, say it to Anthony, because Daniel volunteered him yet again. <laughs> yep, and that's open-ended apparently forever, so... <laughs> Just keep on sending it. That's Bye. right. <laughs> See, and Daniel was so confident in Anthony that he felt that he didn't need to be here on this episode. So Anthony will once again be taking double duty this week. Yeah, he wasn't on the last one either. <laughs> Daniel. <laughs> I think he's taking his volunteering ability way, way too far. But well, well he's gonna he, he volunteered to, to like record th the next three episodes solo. Is that it? He's doing <laughs> oh, them all. Yeah, he did say that. Yep. I think yep. we should all volunteer him for that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's shoot him an email just to remind him. There you go. Okay. Cool. Well, if you want to hear the next three Daniel specific episodes, be sure to send an email, a comment, something. I mean, of course, it's got to go through Anthony, but if it's meant for Daniel, he'll eventually get it and then he'll have to be back on the episode. Everything you wanted to know about Daniel, but we're afraid to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would like that. A three hour episode of Daniel just being yeah, on Daniel. there in the mic. <laughs> <laughs> he'd be frazzled by the end, but he'd, he'd, he'd hang in there. <laughs> It'll be a Daniel specific episode. So his his southern charm, his philosophical talent, and his his uh, current New York whimsy, I think, would make for an interesting collection of podcasts. That would just be historic or and, hysteric, one or the other. Yeah, I think hysterical. I think that's what it would end up being. <laughs> It would be some kind of Cthulhu thing where at the end Daniel's mind would just kind of shatter. But at least it would be thematic. It's a board game theme about losing your mind in a Cthulhu game. So being on three podcasts in a row all by yourself and your mind shattering. I think the fans, especially the Merit Clash, Merit Theme Games fans, would really appreciate that of Daniel to go that extra mile. So with that said, we're so glad again to have you join us. And let's get into the episode. Shout it from the tabletops. Sir, you're going to need to get down from there. We have a little bit of convention news, and that is the big Dexcon convention. For us, it's huge. It's a, it's a five days. It's longer than Gen Con, so that's how big it is. Impressive. Um, are you guys going? Absolutely. Board Gamers Anonymous will be at Dexcon 18th, Wednesday, July 1st through Sunday, July 5th, 2015 in Morristown, New Jersey. Yeah. We've talked about their conventions in the past. They're outstanding. They're family-friendly. The people who run the convention, especially Vinny and his whole cast of characters and crew, you walk into this convention. It's not your typical kind of like you pay your money, you punch your ticket, and then you kind of get shoved around for the entire day. It's a family, friend, gaming-friendly convention, and this is their big Dexcon convention. So as Drew was saying, five days, you got your vendors, you got your events, you got your gaming. You should absolutely check this out. 
doubleexposure.com. Take a look at the Dexcon 18 announcement. There is still time to sign up. And they're just going to have some really, really fun things. Your normal convention stuff as far as all the activities, but a number of different events. So, you know, get on there. They make a, uh, they, they take pains to make it really family friendly. So it, there's always something for everybody and a, a, a lot of family games. Yeah, and when we're talking about family friendly, we're not talking about 6,000 kids running around. We're talking no, about no, no, no. you are part of this family environment. You are part of double exposure and you're able to sit down with any group of gamers and get to play a game. A lot of LARPs. I always think, you know, if, if dads, you like LARPing, you want to bring your kid, as long as they're not two years old to join you in a LARP. There there are a lot of good ones that are perfect for families. A great chance to introduce your kids to something like that. Intelligent kids who who want to learn and have some experience at this are always welcome. As long as they are chaperoned by their parents or guardians. Absolutely. And especially just an absolute insane number of tournaments, of giveaways, of games. You got to take a look at this list. It's crazy. I want to sign up for everything. (laughs) So Um, if you haven't signed up yet, you want to sign up right now. The special events and panels are closing up quickly because there's so many people heading out to this convention. If you're not in the New York, New Jersey, tri-state area, this doesn't seem like the bigger kind of conventions. But let me tell you, Double Exposure knows how to put on a great convention. And you're going to find high-level quality gaming and gamers there to play with. And it's really a great time. Double Exposure especially has a uh, program where they train game masters to teach games so it's a great place to learn new games you've got experienced people that can walk you through it so that's another reason if you're new to this or if you you want to try a new game this is a great place to go to yes that's the best part of these cons because there's always so many games and you want to play them all but you don't want to kind of you know tackle that gigantic rule book but you just sit down at a table they're playing the game they teach you the game and you walk away and now you can play the game with other people so and they have a great library too so you could take the games out and play with other people so it's a good time 1212 events Jeez. man <laughs> okay. I just noticed that 1212 right. well start planning logistics and and there's gen con later on <laughs> And we'll be at that too. So (laughs) if you're able to make Dexcon 18, please come over. Please talk to us. Chat a little bit. Chris says we will save a seat for you at our table. Yeah. And I actually literally will do that. I'll actually have a seat with a little sign on there too. And now our acquisition disorders. Acquisition disorders? That's crazy. Only needs the base game. Nothing else but the base game. The base game and the expansion. See? Nothing else. Just the base game and the expansion and the promos. The base game and the expansion and the promos and, of course, the upgraded components. Why wouldn't you have the upgraded components? So the base game, the expansion, the promos, and the upgraded components. See? That's not too much. But maybe, I don't know, maybe you might need the expansion. So now on to our acquisition disorders. Anthony... What's piquing your interest this week? Oh, right. So, uh, as everybody knows, I'm a bit of a solo gamer. So I'm always looking for something new or interesting out there. And one game that caught my interest that's actually been out for a little bit of time now, but it's the newest in this kind of thematic series of games. Printed by Z-Man Games. I think it's Shadi Torbay. I think it might be French. I don't know. Maybe Spanish. <laughs> Someone out there knows, and please feel free to write in and let me know. They will, they will correct us. Don't worry. I, I hope so. Keep me from continuing. All right, so the first game in that series, Onirim, has been out for a little while. I think the second edition is now available. You can get it with, like, seven expansions or something crazy like that. It's not necessarily the same as this new one, which is called Sylveon, but it's the same kind of idea system thing he's got going on, um, where it's a one to two player game. It's basically designed as a solo play. And the this particular one, Sylveon, is actually tower defense, where you're building a deck that's going to help you defend against these creatures or this combat that the game's going to throw your way. So from what I've read, it's significantly more in-depth and involved than Onirim. It requires more attention. It takes longer. I think Onirim is 15 minutes. This one's 30 per play. And 30 minutes for a solo play is pretty long. I can burn my way through some pretty hefty games in 30 to 45 minutes playing them solo. So that's a pretty substantial game. And it actually comes with two expansions already, just out of the box uh, in this new version for the new game that uh, Z-Man's released. So there's already a ton of replayability just right there so 
I'm pretty excited for it because I love solo games and this one kind of already takes all that stuff and comes out of the box with it because there's something to be said for a game that's designed to be played that way versus a game where it's kind of tacked on at the end or you have to change something or use a dummy player or a robot. This one looks pretty cool to me. So you'd, you'd like to play that game? I would love to play that game. But you don't have a copy? I do not yet have a copy, no. <laughs> hmm, maybe I can uh, help you out with that. Z-Man was nice enough to send, us, send me a review copy, but since I'm not where you are, I have it and you don't. So I'll well, drop it in the not, mail for you. Well, that's not helpful at all. <laughs> I will drop it in the mail for you and uh, look forward to hearing a review from you on that. That would be fantastic. All right. See, so, I learn something new every day. I hop on here, didn't even know that the game on my acquisition disorder list was already in our possession. It's it's on its way to you. The game fairy up in Vermont comes through. So from uh, one week, it's on acquisition disorder. And another week, it'll be on at the table. Yeah, that's cool. Oh, Anthony, right. you had the game all along. <laughs> <laughs> Just click your heels. There's no game like Sylveon. There's no game like Sylveon. Oh, uh, that's awesome. I look forward to playing it. That's going to be a fun one. All right. <laughs> a game that's on my acquisition disorder is a game that recently wrapped up on Kickstarter, 12 Realms Bedtime Story. Now, we've talked about 12 Realms previously and its expansions. Now, with Bedtime Story, it adds a little more complexity that we were really looking for in 12 Realms. Now, if you haven't played the game before, it's a cooperative fairy tale game where you get to play one of the traditional fairy tale characters and you're trying to fight back the evil that's spreading across your particular land, but you can work with your other fairy tale characters to push back the evil and to knock out the big bad guys. Now, in Bedtime Story, it adds some new unique bad guys and also some unique good guys too, which is always really nice to see because the miniatures in this game are outstanding. And they bring in really interesting characters. So in this pack, you have Merlin, you have Sinbad, you have King Arthur, which is always really cool to see. But you also have the classic characters like Snow White and D'Artagnan and Robin Hood, which is also great. And then, of course, you have your bad guys. Now, your bad guys can be everything from Frankenstein and the Horseman and the Blob and the Werewolf. So more of your classic type of villains and horror characters in the classic kind of days now with the boards here they're going to be separated by walls if you want to bounce around to the other player boards you're going to need to knock down these so it actually adds another obstacle that the previous game did not have but you'll be fighting dr jekyll so you got to jump over there and there's steam barons and there's a lot of steampunk and there's also more of an asian theme this time too so the bull demon, the spider demon, and the azure lion are there to fight. So really interesting, really fun, and it's something you should take a look at if, if you've been enjoying Bedtime Story up to this point because it adds a lot more. To oh, so Bedtime Stories is not an adult version of Once Upon a Time. Well... I, I was totally playing it wrong. <laughs> totally. Yeah, well, that's for a different podcast, Drew. <laughs> okay. So that's everything for our acquisition disorders this week. And now, At the Table with BGA. All right, so this last weekend, I had uh, Chris and Dave over to the house to play some games. Dave! Um, Dave! <laughs> so you know what kind of games we were playing. Euros! <laughs> with Dave! Um, <laughs> sorry. It was a lot of fun, though. It was awesome. It was My birthday was the week before, so I figured, hey, why not come over? I'll have some food and stuff. And we hung out and played four games, which for me is like a month's worth of gaming at this point. <laughs> so it was, it was pretty awesome, including a couple of games that I've been wanting to play for a very long time. And another one that I love and haven't been able to play in a while is Zulkin, the Mayan Calendar. Mm -hmm. So this is a game that I feel like has been floating around us kind of in orbit for the last year or so and every time i see it it kind of shoots off into another uh, plane of existence so whether it's just i'm playing something else or it's just too late and we're not ready to play it whatever it is if i bring the game <laughs> and i forget to bring the rules and i don't know how to teach it to you yeah I, think, I was being nice, Drew. But if you oh, wanna... No, I have to. I have to come clean. Sorry. I right. think the problem was you just didn't consult your Mayan calendar to see what the actual game day was going to be, Anthony. <laughs> you were working by a Julian calendar, and it just wasn't going to work with a Julian calendar. That see, that's probably the problem. I knew. I knew I messed something up. There. <laughs> uh, 
Calendar jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! Never ending. <laughs> Zulk in the Mayan Calendar. If you if it, if you're trying to place the name of that, it's this it's the game with the big spinning wheels. And if if you haven't seen that, then you haven't seen this game because it's so it stands out very clearly in a game store if somebody's playing it because it looks so cool. It also happens to be incredibly good, so that's awesome. It's good when a great mechanism is used in, uh, effectively in a good game. So it's a worker placement game, but it's also got a little bit of a I'm not going to say programming, but you have to kind of think a few moves ahead. On each of your turns, you're going to place your workers down in one of these slots on the wheels. And then each turn, and the turns go by super fast, the wheels will turn one slot. And your goal is to get your worker to whatever spot on the wheel you want them to be for the action you want to take. Um, So on any given turn, you can put as many of your workers down as you want, and you can lift as, or you can lift as many of them up as you want. You can only do one or the other. And if you have placed all your workers, then you have to lift some up. And if you have all your workers lifted up, then you have to place some. So you have to think ahead like a crazy number of moves to to make sure that you're able to do what you want. Throughout the game, there's going to be a number of times when you stop. There are four little markers on the big wheel. I think there are 26 turns overall or 25 turns. So it's going to stop every six or so turns. And you're going to get extra bonus resources on two of those. And you're going to score on the other two of those. And at the same time, you have to have extra food to feed all your workers. So there's all this stuff you have to juggle. And you have to make sure you have everything you need at the right time. There are temple tracks you can work your way up for a ton of points. I think the majority of the points come off the temple track and the uh, Crystal Skull track. I'm not going to butcher the names of these, but the, <laughs> there's a blue track where you're going to place down Crystal Skulls and get points back, and that's going to help you move up the, the Temple track. That's where most of the points come from. Then there's another track where you can kind of upgrade various parts of how, how you're playing, so you can get bonus food or bonus resources or bonus building abilities. And then there's a third area where you where you can buy buildings or monuments, and those are going to give you even more opportunities. The buildings tend to be short in-game bonuses that kind of help you out there, and the monuments are generally all victory point related. So it's going to be like, for every food tile you have, score four points. So most of those came out to like, a good chunk of points at the end of the game. So buying those is kind of a necessity. There's a lot going on here. It took Dave like 30 or 40 minutes to teach us this game, but he did a fantastic job because when we dove in, I was 100% ready to play. It it was a little brain burning because at any point in time, I had to think, okay, I need to get to the sixth slot on that wheel. We have seven turns left. So I got to make sure I pick up this meeple but this time and place it down at this time so in the last turn i could pick it back up but i gotta make sure i'm able to put down and pick up something in every single turn there's just so much going on that's the killer is you can't put down and take off at the same turn it has to be you're either putting all putting down or all taking up that's what makes it hard exactly yeah there's like a rhythm to it and if you if you miss the rhythm or make a poor decision at certain point, or waste a turn, you're in a bad place. So sometimes you have to lift a little early to make something happen. Sometimes you have to make a hard decision, like if you want to get to the food underneath the wood on that track, for example, you have to burn the wood down and take take the food directly, but then it hurts you on the temple track. So there's a lot going on. And in the end, it was a lot of fun, and I think the score was relatively close. It was It was a lot of fun, and I feel like this was the perfect game to start the day with especially learning a bunch of new euros. If we'd played this five or six hours in, it might have been a little rougher. Oh, so you're calling this a warm-up game. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to me, the heaviest game is always the warm-up game because if you wait to play that one, you're already burnt out. What I really find interesting about this game is that, as you said, Anthony, it's very simple mechanics. You either place or you pick up, and that's it. That's the entire movement selection you can do. And yet when you place your meeples down in these gears and they kind of move around, there's a lot of thinking that goes on. Where are you going to go for on the track? Are you going to go for the skulls? You need to feed your people, so you need corn. And how do I move up the technology track? Because I'm going to need those and I want to build a monument, but I also want to build buildings. So games that have very simple steps or very simple actions and yet have almost seemingly infinite complexity which is always the mark of a great game it's the greatest example i've found of what of a subcategory of game i'm calling worker displacement Mm. where it's not about 
where you put the player, it's when you remove the worker. And the longer you wait, the, the greater the riches. Timing is everything uh, in this game. And uh, a fantastic worker displacement game. Oh, especially, we talked about, Anthony brought up about the, the turns. Once per game, if you're in control of the wheel, you can move it up two clicks. Yes. So you can shorten the game. And again, if you're getting close to feeding time, you can advance it to feeding time if, if some other players aren't ready and they could be in trouble if they mm-hmm. don't have enough corn. It's a very cool game. It's a surprising game. And if you do see this on the table, as Anthony was saying, absolutely sit down and play this game. I think you'll really enjoy it. Yeah, definitely. This is a, It's a heavy play for me, borderline buy. Um, I would definitely consider it. And on the bonus plus side, I got to whip out the uh, treasure chest for this one. Nice. Which uh, <laughs> we converted Dave in like two minutes on that one. So. <laughs> Dave always gets mad at me because I'm a big fan of Chrome in games. And he's like, ah, oh, you don't need all those fancy pieces. And he starts pulling out the cubes. I'm like, hey, Anthony, don't you have the treasure chest? And he's like, ah, don't you guys don't need that. And then as soon as he had that gold in his hand everything changed <laughs> you, you're not gonna you're not gonna persuade me ever all i need are wheels and rondelles that's it, it man that sells me on a game i don't know man yeah. i spent the entire hour and a half playing with the gold bricks just like clink <laughs> clink, 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 clink 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 oh yeah you drive my dad crazy <laughs> you'd always say are you gonna play with your chips or are you gonna play the game you know you would have driven him crazy Ah, good times, good times, good game, good game. Yeah, so, best way to play. Yeah, I would say for me too, Anthony, this is a strong play and a possible buy. I'm really looking forward to playing the expansion. And if the expansion adds, I don't know what you could add more, but if it adds a little bit more, it might meet my buy category. I've got the expansion. Well, John John McCallion in his collection, he has that expansion. I haven't broken it out yet, but I've, I've read it over. It has uh, like clans, different uh, power that your clan will have so it does throw in variable player powers very nice i always love that another game that i finally and i I think anthony's (laughs) in the same boat here too a game that we both finally were able to complete is i don't know i I guess you could say at this point the quintessential feld the castles of burgundy yeah we actually got to finish a game i for me personally i must have played half a dozen (laughs) half a dozen castles games and never got to the last step for some reason because either our time was running out or i'm playing games online and dave still hasn't taken his turn yet dave dave take your turn dave (laughs) but otherwise we actually got a game done and it was fun and i was really glad i got a chance to play this i own this game i even plano box this game because it has all the chits in the world and we talked about the chits last week so you you know you're up to date as far as what those are And we played with the asymmetrical board, so everyone had a different board, which I was really looking forward to playing with because, I don't know, for me personally, if everyone has the same track and the same tableau, it's a little bit boring. So we played with the asymmetrical boards, which were fun. We really weren't sure what we were doing, but we kind of threw them on the table. And I don't know, I had a great time. And if you haven't played Castles, basically what it is is you are buying from... Six different markets that are determined by the dice that you roll. So if you roll a one and a six, you'll be able to choose from the one market and the six market. You choose a tile, a hex in this case. You place it in your tableau board in a little staging area. And then later on, when you roll the dice again, you'll be able to place those hexes into your own tableau board depending on the number. So if you roll a five, you can take one of your hexes and place it in the five as long as it corresponds to that particular color. Now, there are hexes that allow you to alter this. There are workers that allow you to alter the dies. And basically, it's production buildings, it's animals, it's castles, it's mines, it's ships, it's shipping goods for money. There's a special black market that you'll be able to buy certain building and hexes at a cost. But this game is outstanding. We talked about this a little bit earlier several times. Feld has been talking about bringing out a dice version and card version of this game. And really the only thing that lets this game down, don't listen Dave to this part, is that the component quality is quite poor. But no complaints. It's a great game. It's a buy. I'm glad I own it and I love this game. And what about you, Anthony? What did you think? Yeah, this is a fantastic game. And it's one that 
like having played half of it a couple times, I was frustrated both times because I knew I enjoyed it, but you can't really fully appreciate a game until you've finished it, especially a Feld, because you don't know what the score is going to be until you get there. Um, this is a game that it has so many options and so many different ways to play, and yet it manages to mix in just enough randomness with just enough mitigation so that you can control the randomness. Like, at any given point, you can make decisions that will offset the roll of the dice, or you could go with the roll of the dice and build your strategy on that. It, there's so much going on here that you really... It kind of captures that feel of just, like, chaotic anything goes of a feld, except very well organized. And I'm, I'm, very, I'm all about um, organized chaos in gaming. I think that's awesome. So, for me, this is a game that I would absolutely play again anytime. I wish I had bought it when it was on sale, as you did. I'm, I think it's a little harder to find now, so that's frustrating. But my hope is that they reprint it and upgrade the components a little, and then I will be happy to pick up the newer, nicer version of said game. Yes. Um, Guys, don't we have enough games with the word castle in them already? <laughs> Does it always have to be castles? What's, what's wrong with the... The split level ranch homes of Burgundy. Why couldn't we have that? <laughs> I mean, based on Why? the artwork, it could be anything. It's not <laughs> true. Yeah. I guess if you if you're going to have a theme that it's going to be built around buildings, it might as well be castles because there's nothing greater than a castle. So, you know, it's like if you're going to have a theme that's around mythical creatures, it might as well be dragons because there's nothing greater than a dragon. So, yeah. Um, and I think this is where Feld gets his reputation for point salad because when you're completing sections, when you're putting down certain tiles, you're scoring a lot of points. But I like that about this game because it gives you an idea of where you are in competition with other players because this is very much a solo type of game with the exception of you could buy tiles that other people need, but it's not really beneficial to you. So... I enjoyed this game. It's fun. And Anthony and I are going to actually get another full game of this played very, very soon. <laughs> Guaranteed. Yes. All right. All right. So that's everything for our At the Table with BGA. And now BGA's feature review. So for our feature review this week, we wanted to jump back into the mailbag and talk more about your comments and questions. They kept coming in when we were doing the last episode and we wanted to put them all together. And as we said, we wanted to get Drew in on it. So now that he's here, uh, Drew, answer all the questions. <laughs> yes, maybe 13 and Feld. Ah, done. We'll post the questions <laughs> in the show notes. No, no, no. We love your questions and we love having them as part of our episode. So, Anthony, why don't you start us off with one of the questions? Yep, for sure. Um, so we got a bunch of stuff in like immediately after we finished recording the last feedback episode. So these are all the ones that didn't make it. If you weren't on the first one, here they come. Uh, the first question on the list is from Donna. And she asks, my question is, what would be a suitable board game for playing with a group of six to eight year olds that are mostly used to playing electronic games and one that will encourage team working rather than competitiveness? I am based in the UK and the question is for a group of scouts. Wow. What do you think, guys? I would say for ages six to eight and if it's going to be about five to ten players and if they're scouts, maybe they're outdoors. So you need a game that can kind of hold up to that. I think you're thinking of a dexterity game. I think that probably would fit. Maybe um, Click Clack Lumberjack or maybe Pitch Car might be fun, especially if you do have the space. Because if you could build one of those gigantic Pitch Car kind of tracks, I think the kids would get a kick out of that. And that plays with a ton of people. So as long as the space and the money is not a, you know, a problem, then I would go with Pitch Car. But if it is... I would go with um, Click Clack Lumberjack. You can actually pick up a bunch of those, and it's a lot of fun. Yeah, Pitch Car might be a little tough just because it's so hard to find and pretty pricey. But like you said, build your own. Yeah. I mean, you could – any like any you know, dexterity games, anything where kids are active and moving around. All right, awesome. So there you go, Donna. Some uh, recommendations for your uh, six- to eight-year-olds. Uh, next question comes from Leshki, and they ask, so I thought of a fun question I'd be curious about. It's time to make the ultimate board game. Which qualities from all the board games you have played would you take, and what rules would you change to make it the most ultimate board game ever? 
rondells. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, as long as you're going around in circles, I'm, I'm tickled. And yet, there's there's an inevitability about going around in circles that is frustrating. You have to go around. You got to keep moving. I I would throw in a little opportunity to move backwards. Maybe you have to spend something or give up something. Uh, you have to pay a penalty. But I, I don't think rondelles should be inevitable. All of going around all the time. Give some variation, some opportunity to shake it up. But rondelles are awesome in a game, uh, as long as we can have some variations to it once in a while. If for me, I'd probably say some form of worker management, worker placement. That seems to be the mechanic I enjoy the most. But at the same time, if when implementing that, it's got to be done in a way that it makes sense. And as Daniel's always saying, there need to be interesting choices to make. It can't just be throwing a bunch of workers on the board, picking a bunch of workers up off the board. There's got to be cool things you can do with them. Maybe I just have Zolkin in my head too much right now, or <laughs> such a cool thing you could do with the workers. But some games, the worker placement is just a means to an end, and others, it's the entire core of the game. It's what makes the game work. And those are the games I tend to gravitate towards. At the same time, the decisions I make should always matter. I don't like a game where it's possible for me to have a turn in which I do nothing. Um, and that goes for worker placement games as well, where everything gets blocked out or everything's locked up or I p- purchase something that maybe I can't use because of some random element. Everything has to work towards something, but, you know, within the challenge of me having to build a strategy. So smart games do it well. Trick taking games do it poorly. Got to have good decisions. I would like to see Euro games have more of a theme now uh this is kind of an obvious thing and i know dave is yelling at me right now through the, through the headphones but not as far as they need they have to have a theme themselves but it would be really nice if somehow in some way and the tempest universe does this a little bit is if the game's connected to part of a larger universe so we were talking about castles of burgundy previously well in some way, could that connect to Bruges or could that connect to Amerigo? And if it could, is there something, is there a way to have either a unique character or a tableau? Like, let's say you did play Castles of Burgundy and you built this wondrous tableau. Could you have a legacy mechanic? And by legacy, I mean a mechanic that would live on beyond that one game and transfer it to another game that maybe would give you a bonus. So you sat down, you played four Feld games, and let's say you played Bruges and you built all these houses and had all these interesting people. What if you could take one of those people and play that in Amerigo? Maybe that would be your ship's captain or something. So I would love to see these games kind of live on past that one play and interact with other games in a larger world. Oh. I'm trying to think now how we can combine those three things. What about this? I got this, Drew. I got this. How about a unique rondelle that you create in a game and you're able to use that rondelle in other games? (laughs) I would use it in all games. Maybe use it in all games. I see you have Uh, a rondelle. I have brought my own. (laughs) (laughs) Look out! He's got a rondelle! (laughs) Traveling rondelle. Just roll it from one game into the next have rondell will travel god yeah all right so the next question comes from philip and he asks what are the best board games that also have an app you can play it on Hmm, that's a tough one because not all games translate well to apps i would say niroshima hex i've played that a lot it's a very quick fast playing hex placement game where you're kind of battling against either one opponent or multiple opponents and, you know, the AI is pretty decent, although not great, but that plays really well. And I would say Suburbia, at least in the online versus the AI, plays very well, although the campaign mode is very frustrating because you absolutely positively have to meet a certain goal. So Suburbia plays really well. And I'm going to throw in Small World. Small World plays outstandingly well on an app especially since it kind of manages all those chits and those special player powers that's really fun yeah i would throw san juan in there i play that one a lot yes excellent that's a great app um can play the games really fast actually there's a lot of games that you can just knock out quick um there's a couple that i wouldn't necessarily recommend because they're not the prettiest things in the world but 
Uh, I think we mentioned this a few weeks ago that Medici has an app. Yes. You can play that game in like five minutes on the app, and it's a lot of fun. It doesn't look great, but it's fun. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a good that's a good translation, and it's not the most thematic or vibrant board in the world to start with. So the app kind of matches it, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Lords of Waterdeep is a very faithful rendition mm-hmm. of the board game. Uh, it's I I think it falls into that category for a lot of people, including us, where the app makes it a little tougher to play on the table, but. Yes. Just because you can burn through it so quick on the on the iPad, um, but there's a lot of good ones out there. I think Pandemic has a new one that just came out. Yes, that works pretty well. Keeps track of a lot of stuff for you. So some good apps out there. Yeah, Ticket to Ride is great out there. Star Realms is great. So those are some apps that uh, go pair nicely with awesome games. Next question comes from Will, and he asks: With limited space, what board game would you recommend bringing with you on a camping trip for the weekend? Something that can probably be played on an uneven surface with or without picnic tables. Will we? Or was that Will Smith? Which one? Which one is it? Drew, we get so many celebrity questions that we just don't (laughs) want to mention their names. I mean, we promised them that, okay? Yeah, we anonymize to protect them, okay? (laughs) I mean, if if, if there's one thing we do is we don't name drop, okay? We're anonymous. We're the anonymous podcast. All right, so especially for a camping trip, you're thinking something small. You're thinking portable. You're thinking rugged. I'm going to say the Duke, especially if you got two players. The board is small, but not so small that you're going to lose it. And yet at the same time, the pieces that you're going to be playing with are these nice, chunky wood pieces with the engraved markings on that. So you don't need to bring the rule book with you because everything you need is on the pieces. So fold up that little board, get those bags of squares, and you're good to go. Another one is Blocus. I think, because that can take even four people. Again, it's the same thing. You've got solid pieces you're putting down on a board. Mm -hmm. Um, It doesn't have to be completely level because um, a good set will uh, will keep everything in place. Uh, I think camping tends to go more for abstracts anyway. I had a copy for a while of the portable Catan, which was pretty cool because you'd drop the the hexes into slots that would hold them in place, and everything would kind of drop into pegs. So the houses were on pegs and everything, and there was little holders for it. So you could play it in the car if you wanted to. So that'd be a good one to take with you. Also Hive, you know, you get those big chunky tiles. Sure. Um, It wants a semi-flat surface, but as long as you're not playing on a rock, you should be fine. And then from personal experience, I know that Friday the 13th is a great game to play while standing at a banister waiting for someone's <laughs> apartment to be unlocked. So you can bring that one, too. That's pretty easy. Although I don't think you want to play Friday the 13th on a camping trip, especially if it's near Silver Lake. That's true. There you go. See? You can bring poison. <laughs> poison. I was, I was thinking about that. Let's, cards are theoretically a great game to play on an uneven table you don't need an even surface to play cards mm-hmm. but what about the wind you're outdoors a little gust of wind pew! is there anything with like a heavy like a card or light tile game where it's solid enough the wind won't just blow everything away as far as a card game yeah. oddball aeronauts is kind of a little bit complicated version of war and what's fun about this and what's great about this, Drew, you know, as far as your suggestion is concerned, is you keep the deck of cards, your deck, in your hand at all times, and you play the first, I guess, the first three cards, and then depending on the results, they go back to the bottom of your hand. So well, they, they never go down the table. They never go down the table. So this is a game you can play standing up with two players or four players. Perfect. Yes. All right. So those are some awesome games you can play. Well, on a camping trip. All righty. And then we had one more email that came through. This one was from Ibrahim. Uh, It's a little bit longer, so I saved it for last, but I will read it. So here is his message. He says, Board Gamers Anonymous is one of my favorite podcasts about board games. You guys always talk about interesting topics that not always are game reviews or how a game plays, and that's what makes it special for me. Uh, Reviews are everywhere in the form of podcasts, YouTube videos, or articles, but it's actually hard to find unique topics like yours, and that's what a lot of us want to hear, topics that go beyond the simple things in the board gaming world. Uh, One topic I would love to hear from you, and if possible from listeners, is the benefits of board games, Hmm. but not those benefits we all know, like exercise your brain or improve your memory, the ones that make us a better person or make us happy. 
For example, I had a friend who had speaking issues, and he improved a lot by explaining the rules of every game he knew to new players. He purposefully signed up in a meetup group to explain games and improve himself. Uh, another story is my own. I'm originally from Venezuela, but currently living in Barcelona. Arriving to a new country can be really hard, and also making new friends is tough. I spent nearly four years alone with my wife, with no friends, and while we attended to some outdoor activities, these activities were not really our thing. I discovered the evolution of board games and fell in love with them, so I started attending more board gaming groups, and now we find amazing people to play with, and we even go together with them to different activities. One final example is how games in English have helped my wife to improve her English skills. She learns new vocabulary more frequently by playing games in that language. So a lot of different examples already from Ibrahim on that one, um, but he wants to get our thoughts, and probably we could throw this to the listeners too and get some thoughts on this question. So the benefits of board games for you and your life and the people around you. Well, it talks a little bit about language. I think it is helpful for learning new words. One of the very first games I played in my family was Meal Born, which uh, duplicated English and French words on every on every card. So we were learning French while playing that game. I think that's a benefit. You can actually get foreign language versions of familiar games very easily. Games like Catan are published in a number of different languages. You know the rules. Pick up it's a great way to pl- to learn French or to learn Spanish. That's that's my first idea. Well, I think he hit an, a number of the really big points. Socializing, and it sounds simple, it sounds easy, but the opportunity to have an icebreaker like a board game to bring people together at the table, we're always advocating for this. And it makes strangers into friends. And you get to know a lot about people by playing games with them and connecting with them in those small conversations that happen as you play the game. I would say for me, what was one of the really interesting things that I got from playing board games, especially Euro games, is how to organize, how to work efficiently, how to think strategically, and how to kind of anticipate and think tactically when need be. Or I think even as Anthony was saying it, or even I say to my work, you know, organizing chaos or managing chaos. You know that chaos is going to happen and you're going to plan the best you can in your life to kind of strategize and organize and be as efficient as possible. And I think for me, strangely enough, and I think you hear this from some actors, when they play a role over and over again, they become more like the character. The more I play Euro games, the more my mind kind of sharpens as far as, Am I doing things as efficiently as possible, whether it's in work or whether it's in my personal life? Could I do things? Could I kind of manage things better? Can I delegate kind of like in a worker placement game? And sometimes, funny enough, I actually do think in those terms, like I have these three workers. Where can I place them to do certain things? And how could that benefit, you know, my action economy? So from a professional standpoint, Euro games have helped me tremendously. Mm-hmm. Awesome, man. I think similarly at work, and I sometimes feel bad about it. <laughs> I'm like, my employees are not tokens on a board. <laughs> you mean your meeples? I mean people. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> if I actually start seeing meeples walking in my office, we have another problem. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I think one of the major benefits has, you know, he hits on a, a lot of points there. Getting out and meeting other people has probably been the biggest benefit to me. I have actually was in the very much the same boat moving to New York for the first time five, six years ago. I worked for myself for several years, so didn't really get out and socialize much. And board gaming is how I kind of got out again and met new people and made friends in the city. But another one recently has just been uh, something to do with my son that's not video games or TV or uh, completely mindless activities. And don't get me wrong, I love spending time with my son and playing whatever crazy games he's come up with. But there are some activities that get mildly monotonous. Um, (laughs) Any parents out there know exactly what I'm talking about. And you might love it, but in your head you're screaming, please let there be something different to do. And board games are that something different because he is like obsessed with it. He knows I enjoy it. He enjoys it. He has almost a dozen board games of his own at this point. Um, But even still, he likes sitting with me and whether I'm learning the rules to a new game or just sorting pieces, he loves to help. He was sitting with us actually the other day, Dave and Chris were over, sorting through my treasure chest while we were playing something else once we'd finished up with Zulkin. 
and he was just fascinated watching the game, even though he didn't quite understand what was going on. That, to me, is a major benefit, because I know this is something we're going to enjoy for many years to come, and just seeing him kind of explore that is pretty cool. One thing I like about board games is the way that it can take complete strangers and get them interacting excitedly, the kind of thing where at the end of the game you're talking to each other like, oh, yeah, we've known each other for a long time. Let me give you an example of a game, Battlestar Galactica. As tedious as that game is to me, at the end of every time I've played that game, we're all excitedly talking about what happened, how it went down. The game continues long after it's over. Uh, That's what I think some board games can really accomplish, is a greater depth of social interaction. Sure, it's about a board game, but you're, you're actually having conversations with strangers. And who knows, that could lead to more conversations and just having fun. Hey, let's go out and grab a bite to eat. Games like Battlestar Galactica really up the ante in social interaction. I wish that there were a simpler version of Battlestar Galactica, something that that wasn't so tedious, but you know what? It has that benefit, so I'll keep on playing it. (laughs) That's a great one, because that's exactly what happens, and I 100% agree about the game. So, (laughs) um, But I mean, to your point, the three of us met over a game two and a half years ago, and now here we are recording whatever episode 76 of a podcast yeah. so you never know where that socialization is going to lead yeah, exactly and i think too for us to be able to experience in a, in a very you know in a very small tiny simplistic type of way the multiple cultures ideas and philosophies like we we're just talking about zulk in the mayan calendar or the endless number of german and euro games or Say J. Kanai coming out with games from Japan and having a little taste and a little insight into someone else's cultures, values, and ideas, and then to kind of play that and interact with that in a really meaningful way, really just kind of open up the world and give you at least a little peek into someone else's life. I would love to play more games from other countries. Absolutely. So... Awesome question. Actually, if you have an answer of your own, if you're listening and you think that's a great question or I have a great story, shoot it over. We will read it on the podcast. That is all of the questions we got in that last little burst at the end of our uh, listener feedback open call. But there's plenty of other questions that come in and feedback, and we're going to try to make this part of the, a regular part of the episode where we just read one or two of these every episode or two. So if you have questions or comments or want to be on the podcast in any way, Reach out and let me know. Daniel has made an open invitation for the rest of my life, apparently. (laughs) And I will check all the different many places of the Internet. So that's everything for this week. As Anthony was saying, please keep in contact with us on Facebook, Twitter, BoardGamersAnonymous.com, our guild on BoardGameGeek. Give us a review on iTunes and Stitcher. And if you have a chance, we would really appreciate a donation on Patreon.com. Until then, this is Chris. This is Anthony. And this is Drew. We'll save you a seat at Dexcon 18. 